guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Here we are. Jesus is sitting at the table, and he's about to take communion with his disciples. And you know what? It's no different than you coming tonight. You tonight, though you're sitting in some chairs, you're sitting at the table of Jesus. You're sitting at the table of the Father. And then Jesus has these remarkable, powerful words that he begins to share. Think about it. This is recorded in the Bible as he's sitting with his disciples and he's having a serious conversation with them days before he is about to give his life for you and me. And he makes his message very clear, and I want you to please hear it tonight differently as we receive communion. He said that Jesus took some bread, and he said he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to the apostles saying, this is my body. So immediately he's painting a picture that this bread is going to be his body. And we know that his body was completely broken for us. We know that his body was completely deformed. As a matter of fact, when you think about uh, uh, Jesus and, and, and what he did, he was dismembered. If you really think about it, the Bible says that when they were through with him, when they gave him the beatdown of his life, he was unrecognizable. That means that even his own disciples looked at him, and they just couldn't, they couldn't remember what he looked like anymore because he was just so, ah, uh, it was just, it, it was painful. Read Isaiah 53 when you go home tonight, it really gives you a, a, a very detailed description of what he went through. But he said, I want you to take this, this, this bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his apostles, saying, this is my body, which I am giving for you. He's saying, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you this body. And he goes on to, to say this. He says, do this to do what? To remember me. The reason we're taking communion tonight is because I want us to remember everything that God has done in us and through us. We need to remember tonight faithfully because right now I know that there are people sitting in here tonight where it's not a good Friday, it's a silent Friday for you. That means that there is nothing happening. That means that there are some things that are happening right now in your silent Friday where you don't even know how you're going to get out of your situation. There are people here right now that are experiencing some silent pain. Where you know what, you, you're, you're, you're putting this front that everything is well, but deep down inside of the crevices of your heart, you are crying right now. You're going through some brokenness. There are people here right now that are experiencing some, some, some sense of just kind of confusion and you feel lost. And so Jesus is saying, when you take communion, what's communion? Communion is simply this, is God wants to have community with us. God wants to have intimacy with us. As you take communion tonight, you're, here's what you're saying. You're saying intimacy is what? Into me see, God. See inside of me tonight, God. Allow God to see on the inside of you and allow him to begin to touch with his, with his special hand of healing. Let him touch those broken places. Let him touch that place right now that you're silent about that only Jesus can heal. And he says, do this to remember me. Everybody say this, remember me. He said, in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new agreement that God makes with his people. Listen, tonight, maybe you and I have made agreements with some very dark things in our life. Maybe tonight, you and I have made some agreements with some things that are literally sucking the life out of us. But tonight, Jesus is saying, as you remember me, we're going to make a new agreement. And it's a new agreement that God gives to every single uh, person. And he goes on to say, and this new agreement begins with my blood. You know why it begins with his blood? Because his blood is the only thing that can take a dark situation. His blood is the only thing that can take a spot and completely cleanse you. You know what? I've been a little bit clumsy this last week. I have dropped coffee or soda or like all week long. It's like I don't even, it's almost like I forgot how to drink. And it's just been like, bam, I'm like, oh, and like I'm going to meetings and stuff. And I'm just thinking, what are these people going to think? This guy doesn't know how to drink and, and it just stains. And you know what? I, I've, I've rushed to Jack in the Box or Carl's Jr. in the bathroom trying to wipe it off. And, and it's like, okay, I got some of it off, but the stain is still there. 
And so guess what? Right now, some of us, we may have a stain. And Jesus is saying, if you want a new agreement and you want to receive a new beginning, it's going to start with my blood. Because my blood is the only thing that can literally remove every single spot and blemish in your life. And Jesus is saying, you must remember this. You must remember that when you're at your darkest hour, when you're at that darkest place in your life, you must remember that I'm the only one that can remove it. No one can remove it but me. That's the power of communion. We're not just here tonight being religious saying, hey, let's go to Good Friday so we can just, you know what, you know, mark that off the task list. Yay, we made it on Easter weekend. No, we're here tonight with an intention. We're saying, God, because I know that every single one of us have some form of stain in our life right now. All of us. But thank God that we get to celebrate a weekend called Easter. And it's called Resurrection Life. And he wants to bring a new life with a new agreement in order for us to have a new beginning. How many are ready for a new beginning today? I didn't even believe you. I don't even think heaven believes you. How many want a new beginning tonight? Yes. Yes. And he says, and so this new agreement begins with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for who? For you. He's saying, hey, listen, everything that I'm doing, I do it for you. And so he says, do this. Do what? Do this. Do this. What's this? Communion. Do this and remember me. Remember what I did for you. And you know what? As I preached last week, you remember, I mean, these these are the most powerful eight days from last Sunday, which was Palm Sunday, up until this Sunday, which is Easter. Why? Because if you remember this past Sunday, I touched on it a little bit, but we know that the people were seeing Jesus coming down from the, from the mountain into the, the triumphant gates of Jerusalem and and we know that as they were seeing him on a donkey coming down there was this sense of reverence and the people started singing Hosanna Hosanna he's the Lord Almighty it is he who comes in the name of the Lord and so they're they're shouting praises it's kind of like us we were all shouting praises to God just a few minutes ago we were we were giving him all the shouts and yay and claps and woo and all that right well the people were doing the same thing back then They believed in him. They said, man, this is the one that is to come, and it is he. And they had such a reverence. They knew the power of this Savior that they started putting down palms, branches of palms. And as they're putting their palms down, Jesus is coming through the palms. And let me tell you something. It's so powerful because the symbolic meaning of palm branches is victory. So what they were saying is, Where Jesus is, there's always victory. You're in the house of God tonight. Guess what? There is victory for you tonight. You don't have to keep fighting for victory. You're going to start fighting from the victory, and your victory is Jesus. And so here they are. They're putting these palms, and they're just like shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. That's where that song came out. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. You guys know that song? Whatever. Whatever. And so they're singing this song, and they're, they're all shouting, yay! But let me tell you something. The same shouts of praises are now the shouts of saying this, crucify him, crucify him. The same people that were, that were blessing God are now cursing him. How many of us have ever probably experienced that where we come and we worship God, we we shout to God, we clap to God, and then we experience something in our life that's so painful and then we turn away from God. We start getting mad at God. And so, yeah, maybe you're not there saying crucify him, crucify him, but maybe we're, we're, we're not pursuing him. We're not seeking him anymore. Check this out. I thought this, this is pretty powerful. They, they lay down palms, and, and, and a little bit later, they, they, they traded in their palms for his palms. And they pierced his palms with nails. The same shouts of, he is the one, are the same shouts of crucify him. Is there something in your life right now that's saying crucify him? You may not be shouting it, 
but there may be some resistance happening in your life. Jesus understands. He understands this so much that he said that he was, he was, he was God in the form of man. Jesus, he experienced every single thing that you and I have experienced in our lifetime. He's experienced abuse. He's experienced everything. He says there's nothing that he has not experienced that he does not understand. And so he says that's why I'm God. And so what is it that you're dealing with right now at this hour that has caused you maybe to kind of resist him a little bit because this is the weekend to come back and get your shout back for Jesus. This is the weekend. This is the hour. Can I get an amen? amen. This is the weekend where Jesus is saying, this is the message. He's saying, hey, listen, maybe right now you're in a place where you do have a silent Friday. Maybe this is the place where you have a silent pain. Maybe this is the time where you feel like your dream and your hope has been buried in a tomb. But God is responding, and he already responding. So many times we, we start saying this, I wonder what I'm going to do now. What will we do? God's saying, hey, listen, stop saying what will he do and start relying upon what he already did. And that's where we come to. That's what we're remembering tonight. We're going to remember Jesus for what he already did, not what will I do. We're going to remember what he already did. That's, that's the starting point right there. And so I know that, that we all experience stuff in life. And I know that we've all been in those places where we just feel weary and, and tired and, and exhausted. And, and even, even sometimes you just kind of feel like, like you're just losing your edge. Like there's just this lack of, of passion. And mind you, this is Passion Week. Jesus was so passionate about you and I that he was willing to endure everything just so that we can be forgiven of our sins. Look at this, Hebrews 12, 2. So what do we do? Here's what we do. He says, let us keep looking. Everybody say keep looking. That's the key, and I would underline that. He says, let us let us keep looking because so many times we stop looking. Let us keep looking. It's amazing how, how many times I'll meet with people and, and they're asking me for counsel and, and I'm trying to bring them back to Jesus, but they're saying, but, 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 but. It's like, well, wait a minute. I just told you how. It's Jesus, but, but, but. And we're looking to some other idea, some other plan. And the, the answer is, no, we need to keep looking to Jesus. We need to fix our eyes back on Jesus. And he says, keep looking to Jesus. He is the one who started this journey of faith. If it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't even have faith today. He says, he started the journey of faith, and he is the one who completes the journey of faith. I love this. He started faith, he completes faith. Aren't you glad that what Jesus starts, he finishes in you and me? Now, now listen. Picture this. When you think about the creation, when you think about everything that, that we have experienced on this earth, when God started everything, he started everything in a place called a garden. It was the garden of what? Eden. No, Eden. <laughs> Y'all don't know the answer, don't talk. It was the garden of Eden. And so Adam was given a great responsibility. God gave Adam a responsibility to, to tend to the flock and to keep his wife in check, right? You don't like that, didn't you? Okay. To serve his wife. <laughs> Anyways. And so it started, it started in a garden. And we know that it was in this garden where, where, where Satan comes in and he begins to tempt them. And he begins to, to, to contradict the words that God had spoken to them. God said, hey, listen, you can have everything, but of that tree you will not touch. And, and Satan came, say, he came and, and spoke to them and said, hey, listen, God really didn't mean what he said. You know, he, he, I mean, why would God want to withhold the whole thing from you? I mean, come on, think about it. He's God. He loves you. And so he, he confused them. He deceived them. He lied to them. And we know what happened. What Adam could not endure, Jesus endured it. Where Adam fell, now guess what? Jesus now is where? At a garden. So it began in a garden and it ends in a garden. And now Jesus is in the garden called Gethsemane. 
And he's in this garden. And we know that in this garden, he's going through some extreme pressure. If you've ever watched the Passion of the Christ, this is a very, very powerful moment. Because this is the same moment of when Adam was also being tempted. Satan shows up in that same garden. And he begins to overwhelm him. Because right here, this was the greatest overwhelming experience that Jesus had as a human. In his humanity, he began to really understand that he's about to take the sin of this entire world upon himself. And so you know how the story goes, right? He's right there. He's under pressure. Now, I, I know that there's, there's such a great revelation of God's word because, you know what, in this garden, which I've been to, the Garden of Gethsemane, it's very powerful. It's not that very big. It's very small. But this is a place where there are olive trees, and there are olive trees there that have been there for 4,000 years, 4,000 years, and they're still blooming olives, which is pretty remarkable, but that tells me that there's a message that God is always trying to get to us. Please listen. So he's in this garden. The story takes place. It started in the garden of, of Eden, and then it ends in the garden of Gethsemane. And Satan comes and he puts the pressure on white pressure because this garden was very particular. This is where they would come and pick all the olives. And you know what? In order to get virgin olive oil that you and I eat today to be healthy, hopefully, they would press the olives and they would crush the olives. And it's only through the crushing and the pressing that they're able to extract the oil that we get to experience today. And so the message that Jesus was giving us here was this. He says, you know what? You and I will experience the greatest pressures of life, but be of good cheer because I'm going to endure every single pressure of your life, and so will you. Now watch this. So, so he's under pressure, and, and, and he's going through all this pain and suffering, and it says, but he paid no attention to the shame of the cross. Mind you. How many of us have sometimes given so much attention to our shame that we start living from that place? And Jesus says, hey, listen, I'm not paying any attention to the shame. Jesus says, I'm taking every sin, and I'm going to nail that sin on the cross, and you have no shame anymore. You no longer have to live in the condemnation of you. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, there is no shame. When you, when you fix your eyes on me, when you start looking back on me, I promise you, your shame will start falling off of you. And he says, and so he paid no attention to the shame of the cross. What's the shame? My sin. Come on, my, my lack of obedience. What's the shame? My lack of, of, of seeking him. What's the shame? Uh, maybe um, the being in bondage of addiction, whether it's alcohol, uh, drugs, what's the shame? Maybe you're addicted to lust and, and you're just like, man, I can't get out of it. I'll tell you why you can't get out of that stuff because you're so bound in your shame. And Jesus says, no, listen, I look beyond your shame. And I still went to the cross. And he says, and he endured. Everybody say endured. I'm almost done with my message. Hang in there. He endured the cross. Why? Why would he even endure something so painful? He gives us the answer. He says, I endured this cross because of the joy that was set before me. You know what that joy was? It was you and me. He looked at every single one of our images, and he knew that you would be here today. And he says, for the joy that was set before me, I was able to endure. And he says, and then... He sat down at the right hand of the Father or the throne of God. What are you needing right now in your life to endure? Because Jesus is saying, look or keep looking to Jesus. The only way to endure whatever it is you're experiencing right now is to look back to Jesus. There is no other answer. He is the only answer. Jesus, keep looking somewhere else. So many times we start looking for other answers in different places, right? We're looking to sister know it all. We're looking to brother tell it all. And we're going to everyone. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I want you to endure. How are you going to endure? You got to keep looking to Jesus. Because when you keep looking to me, he says, I'll give you the strength that will help you endure the things that you're going through. I love this. 
He endured. Look, he endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Do you know this word endure in the Greek? If you guys can place my definition in the Greek, here's what endurance means. It means the ability or strength to continue despite fatigue. Is there anyone fatigued here tonight? Because the Spirit of God wants to give you endurance. He says it's the ability. He gives you and I the ability or the strength to continue. Some of you probably right now, you just feel like giving up. You feel like quitting. You're tired. You're fatigued. He says, nope, I'm giving you the spirit of endurance. You're going to press. Why? Why do I need to press? I'm going to be honest with you tonight. Some of you may not like it, but it's the truth. God is never going to pull you out from a place of press. He won't. Why? That's not fair. Life isn't fair. You know why he won't pull you out of a place of press? First, he put his son there to give you an example of how to press. What did he have to do to press? He looked at the father and he prayed. That was the last prayer he had was in that garden. The last prayer that he had was right there. And he showed you and I, God is not going to remove you from the press. Why? Because here's the deal. If Jesus says that I am the one who started your faith, then I'm the one who's going to complete your faith. And listen, and nobody needs faith until they need endurance. And nobody needs endurance until they need faith. He starts your faith and he completes your faith. The path to least resistance, right, is what he wants us to experience. He wants us to go through this stuff. Look, it also means the capacity. Look, I'm sorry, let me finish reading it. Despite fatigue, stress, or adverse conditions, the capacity to bear up under. Everybody say bear up under. You know what that means? He said, he said, if you're going to follow me, pick up your what? And what? Well, that means I got to bear up under a cross, right? And so life sometimes is you and I having to bear things that are a little bit heavy. But he'll give you the strength to bear it. And so he says, the capacity to bear up under a difficult circumstance, not passive complacency. Here's what endurance is too. It's hopeful fortitude actively resists weariness. Actively, I resist to be weary. Why do you think the Bible says, and do not grow weary while well, while, while doing what? While doing good. Well, guess what? This is Good Friday. It's Good Friday. It's Good Friday. God's going to take a bad Friday, and he's going to give you a good Friday today. And guess what? And he's got a three-day plan for a good Friday. And it's called Resurrection Sunday. In three days, he can turn that mess around. That's what I'm saying. God's doing something new right now in your life. Are you guys getting this? <laughs> but I can't hear God, Pastor. I just can't hear God anymore. I understand you're saying all this, but I just can't hear God. Here's what I've learned. When, when you have a silent Friday, when you... You can't hear God. You know what you do? You read God. You read God. Why? What do you mean read God? You read your Bible. When you can't hear God anymore, you read God. This is his holy Bible. He, listen, he will never put his, his word under for the sake of your feelings and your emotions. He will never turn his back on his own word. Jesus will always stand on his word. What Adam could not withstand, Jesus stood for us. When you can't hear God, read God. And he begins to speak to you. And he begins to encourage you. But you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. So Paul, in closing, Paul is seeing that the church is getting weak. And I love how he starts because the church is experiencing, Christians are experiencing some turmoil. And then Paul starts with this. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 through 36, it says this. He starts with the word, remember. It says, remember those earlier days after you received the light. In other words, hey man, do you remember those days when you had such a, a strong relationship with Christ, where you were so excited, you told everybody about Jesus? 
Do you remember when you used to be so passionate about sharing the gospel? Do you remember when you used to be so passionate about telling your story to people? And he's talking to the church. And he says, you remain strong in a great battle that was full of suffering. Man, in other words, I saw you. Paul's saying, I saw, I know you've all experienced some serious suffering, but I remembered your guys' joy. He said, sometimes people spoke badly about you in front of other people. Have you ever had anyone speak about you? <laughs> but do you remember when, when instead of wanting to just like take them out, <laughs> you know, beat them up, right? Remember when you used to be quick to forgive? Do you remember when you used to be quick to pray for them? Do you remember when you used to pray for your enemies? And he's trying to remind them. He's saying, remember. What did Jesus say? When you take communion, do what? Remember. Do you remember when you were so quick to forgive, when you weren't always so offended? Do you remember when you weren't, you would never fault find people? You would never begin to condemn people? You would never judge people? Do you remember when you used to just say, you know what? I know that's what they're doing, but you know what? Jesus can heal them. Do you remember when you used to believe that your family would come to Christ one day? Now you say they'll never come to Christ. Do you remember that? And he says, and sometimes you were treated badly. And at other times, you stood side by side with people that were being treated like this too. And you suffered along with people in prison. In other words, that's not because they went to prison because they were committing crimes. They went to prison because they were preaching Jesus. And he says, when your property was taken from you, you pulled out your gap and started capping. <laughs> no, that's not what it says. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the L.A. version today. <laughs> Of Christian. I'll show you, man. You know, get all cray cray. No, look what he says. When your property was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. He's like, do you remember when you guys, when you weren't moved, when, when someone did you wrong? Like you didn't go fight for it. You just said, you know what, Lord, bless them, man. They must need it. They must need it more than I do. That's pretty intense, huh? And he's telling them, remember this. He says, you knew that God had given you better and more lasting things. In other words, there was a time in your life where you knew that Jesus was all I needed. Anything else didn't mean nothing to me anymore. Why? Because to live is to live for him. Right? We live for him now. And to die is to gain. I'm going to die to my ways. I'm going to die to my pride. I'm going to die to that anger and that resentment and that offense. And I'm just going to, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Now watch this. This is the most powerful one. So don't throw away your what? Don't throw it away. Another version says don't throw away your confidence. In other words, he's saying this, get your Godfidence back. Stop being so confident and relying on you and put your confidence back on him. He says, don't throw away, don't cast away your bold faith. Why would you release the faith I've given you? It's your faith that brings you victory. Why would you throw that away? This is the hour on Good Friday where Jesus is saying, I want you to remember all the things I've done for you so that you can have some confidence in my plan for your life today. Because it's a new beginning. Can we give Jesus a big hand clap for that one? And here's why. And here's why. Usher start handing out the, the communion. And look, and he even gives us a why. He says, here's why. Because if you do not throw away your confidence, if you do not throw away your bold faith, he says, it will bring you great riches and rewards. How many want to see the reward of God in your life? Then don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your bold faith. Trust him. Verse 36 says, you need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. Look at your neighbor and say to him or her, say, you need to be faithful. No, that was a week. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. That is the answer. You need to be faithful. Then, everybody say then. Then, when you start being faithful to God, when you start being faithful to walk like Jesus walked, he says, then and only then, 
Look, you will do what God wants. See, you'll stop doing what you want to do. Some of you didn't want to come to church tonight, but you came. You know why? Because you decided to be faithful. And some of you are saying, hey, I don't need to come on Easter because I came on Friday. Eh. <laughs> Wrong. You need to be faithful. Look at your neighbor and say, I'll see you here on Sunday. Because then you will do what God wants you to do, and you will receive what he what? What he promised you. Some of us are saying, God, God, you, you lie. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And God's like, whoa, 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 slow down, wait a minute, let me put my sense in it, right? He's like, wait a minute, I've been faithful, but where have you been? God's not a man that he would lie. He's, he's faithful. Even when you were unfaithful, God remained faithful to you. I mean, look, you're here. Endurance. Look at your number say endure. All right. I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this final thing. When, when you think about Jesus, I mean, he was tempted for 40 days, 40 nights by Satan himself. He was trying to be stripped from his identity, but he endured it. Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples, by one of his own, betrayed by one of his own people that he served, that he loved, that he forgave, and he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was brought into these these rooms, these, these illegal trials by the Pharisees. I mean, they were keeping it silent. Why? Because they didn't want everyone to find out that they were putting Jesus through all these, these, these places of illegal uh, 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 meetings. And you know what? And Jesus endured it. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, he's relying on his, on his disciples. He said to them, pray for one hour. And every time he would come back, they were falling asleep. They were falling asleep. And he said, could you not pray for me for one hour? But he endured. Jesus, he's healing people, delivering people, restoring people. And all of a sudden, now he's in the hands of Pilate. And Pilate has the power to release him. And the same people that he healed were the same people that were shouting to Pilate, crucify him and crucify him. And Pilate Knowing that he had the power to release him, he did not. But Jesus endured it. Jesus is now in the hands of these soldiers. And they're, they're whipping him, breaking him, tearing his skin up. They're putting thorns on his head knowing that he's the king of the Jews. And they're mocking him. And then they're throwing him around. And they're all throwing punches at him. And they're saying, if you're the prophet, then tell us which one hit you. But he endured it. Jesus said to you and I, he says, keep looking to me and you will endure too. He wants us to endure. What does God endurance look like? Look it on the screen. God endurance is fueled by love. God endurance is filled by grace. God endurance is faithful is hope-saturated, is Bible-based, is Christ-centered, is fueled by passion, is spirit-empowered, is willing to lay down one's cross, is willing to be a living sacrifice, lives for the glory of God alone. And let me tell you something, and God endurance never quits, never surrenders. i rather bow my knee before I give up and quit and pray a prayer of saving grace. And so today as we receive communion, we're going to remember what Jesus has done for us. Amen. Take your communion, please. And I want you to just open it up and just get it prepared. But I want you to hear these, these, these powerful heart-piercing words to this song. And I want you to close your eyes and please think about the moment 
Think about the moment where, where Jesus, where he saved you when it seemed like you weren't going to make it. You know what? I can think about the moment when I'll never forget it. Right before I went to a, a 14-hour surgery, I remember they took me into this room and, and these nurses, they came in and they shaved my entire body. Like shaved, that was very, it was humiliating. You know, here I'm a guy and they, got, they, they could have at least got some, some dude nurses, you know. And they're shaving me, every hair off my body, everything. And then I was fatigued, I was weak. And they said, you got to get up and you got to go wash it off now. Because they put this whole solution on me for the surgery. And as I was going into the shower, I was weak, I was tired. And I'm just like, and, and I knew that they'd given me a 50-50% chance to live or die on that table. And I am weak and they're helping me. And I'm like, and I just thought, I wonder if this is what my Savior felt like. Like he was about to endure the greatest, most painful, most challenging experience called the cross. And I just thought, Jesus, thank you for saving me. If I die, at least I know that I'm going to spend eternity with you. I remember that Jesus saved me on that operating table. No wonder we call him Jesus. Savior, healer, provider lover of people. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.